great to see you here tonight. Uh, what a blessing to uh, see old friends and meet new friends. And, uh, and I appreciate the church having me out and Pastor Brad uh, asking me to come. And we're going to have a good time tonight, tomorrow, and Tuesday night with me. And then Wednesday night for family night. So I am glad you're here. And I know that the church has been praying for uh, these meetings. And so God answers prayer. And God is a God who is faithful. If you have your Bible, please turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I want to talk tonight about the church in Ephesus, the message to the church in Ephesus, because it's a message to you and to me. In 1735, a little baby was born. His parents named him Robert. He was Robert Robinson. His dad died when he was just a, a boy, and his mother, at the age of 15, his mother said, you, son, you need to learn a trade. She sent him to London to learn a trade, and he attached himself to a barber. They had a, a family friend or relative that was a barber, and he was going to teach Robert how to be a barber. And so Robert got mixed in with the wrong crowd, and he was carousing, and he was carrying on. Well, he went to hear the great revivalist George Whitfield. And he went with his buddies, and they went, and they were just going to mock and make fun. But Whitfield was filled with the Spirit of God, and when George Whitfield preached, his message penetrated the heart of Robert Robinson. He didn't make a decision for Christ, but the message haunted him for years. And after three years of fighting the Lord, Robert Robinson finally uh, received Christ and surrendered his life to Christ, and he was saved. And soon after his salvation, he was called into the ministry. And uh, he was a gifted guy, and God was using him. And at a young age of 22, he wrote a song, a song that we still, still sing today, a song called Come Thou Fount of Many Blessings. Come Thou Fount of of, I'm sorry, of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing calls for songs of loudest praise. You're familiar with that song. Well, in that song, he has his testimony in there. He says, Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. And then he says this, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter, like a chain, bind my wandering heart to thee, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. How many can identify with the lyrics to that song? You know, the sad reality for us as believers, Robert Robinson was a believer, is he wrote, even at that young age, that there's a tendency in all of us to wander from the God we love. Hey, the emphasis of this, of these series of me these meetings is revival. And revival is to speak to us who are believers who have wandered, who've gotten a little cold toward the Lord, who've lost our zeal and our passion, so we would get back to where we need to be back white heart hot for the Lord. You know, revival is not for people that don't know the Lord. Revival is a recovery of life, a restoration to life. You got to be vibed to be revived. And uh, if a person doesn't have life in Jesus, he can't be revived. He can be saved, she can be saved, but can't be revived because revival is for Christians. And we so often wander from the Lord and we cool toward the Lord and God has to do something in our lives so that there would be a fresh touch from Him, a time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Now, in the book of the Revelation, John is on the island of Patmos and he gets a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We call it the revelation of John sometimes. It's not the revelation of John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, Christ which he gave to John. It's not revelations plural. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
And he tells to John, hey, write the things that are, the things uh, that shall be. He says in verse 19 of chapter 1, write therefore the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall take place after these things. Verse 20, as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the seven angels or the seven messengers or the seven pastors of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. He's giving a message to seven pastors of seven churches in Asia Minor and the first letter goes to the church in Ephesus. The church in Ephesus was some kind of church. I had the privilege some years ago of going to Ephesus. You know, sometimes you go to these, uh, these ruins and they're like, hey, come see this place. And you go there and it's like, uh, there's nothing here. And, you know, it's like, well, there's a rock there. That used to be something. And there's a little stone here and, and a little column. You go to Ephesus, I was expecting because I had been kind of conditioned that uh, it, there's not much there at, at these, these relic sites. Ephesus, there's a lot there. And you, you turn a corner and all of a sudden it's like, Man, this is a big place. Ephesus was a city of about 250,000 people. They come up with that number because they look at the stadium, the amphitheater that they had, and that held 25,000. Typically, those theaters would be made to hold 10% of the population. So 25,000 seat auditorium, 250,000 people, big library in Ephesus. There's a lot of Ephesus still there, and you can uh, walk those streets, and it's, it's amazing. That was a really important place called the metropolis of, of, uh, of that period and that place. is like this is the place, the metropolis of uh, the Middle East and of uh, Asia area there. And so um, this letter goes to the pastor in Ephesus, the first letter of the seven letters to the seven churches. And this is what the Lord says, to the angel, chapter 2, verse 1, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot endure evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false, and you have perseverance, and you have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Serious problem in Ephesus. Now I want us to, to see what's going on in Ephesus because what the Lord says to Ephesus, he's saying to many of us. Because as a church and as individual Christians, we can be much like this that we're going to see. First of all, I want you to notice that the church in Ephesus was doing lots of great things. And the Lord commends them for the great things that they were doing. This is a, a great church. We would say that if we lived in the first century, we'd say, man, uh, we want to be, let's go to the conference at the church in Ephesus because they got it going on. They're doing some great things. And the Lord says you're doing some great things. Verse 2, I know your deeds because he knows all of our deeds. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance. Hey, they were working hard for the Lord. They weren't sitting around doing a bunch of nothing. They were toiling for the Lord. They were working for the Lord. I know what you're doing, and I know how hard you are working, and I know about your perseverance. I know that you are keeping at it. You have a patient continuance. You're going strong, and I commend you for that. They were working hard for the Lord. The Bible says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. And so he says here, I know your toil and your perseverance. You're doing good. They're working hard for the Lord. Secondly, they were standing against sin. <laughs> he says, and that you cannot endure evil men. That was a good thing. That church was... Doctrinally sound. They weren't just letting, you know, whatever, uh, whatever you want, just whoever's got a word, just come up and preach, and you can get all this kind of heresy going. They didn't do that. They cannot endure evil men. 
They were watching for the truth and making sure that what was coming out of the pulpit was true. They were standing against sin. Now, it says in verse 6, Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You say, who were the Nicolaitans? Well, in Acts chapter 6, there was a guy named Nicholas who was one of the first deacons, Acts chapter 6. And some Bible scholars have said that they think the Nicolaitans come from Nicholas and that Nicholas, although he was uh, tapped to be a deacon and a leader in the church, that he went off the rails and he started preaching a, a gospel that said, you know, it really doesn't matter how you live and you can be a Christian and just kind of uh, there's God's grace so it, you can sin it up and, and that's okay. God just kind of winks at that. And so they introduce compromise and immorality into the church. And the Lord says, I hate that. I hate that. Because we can't have, what fellowship ha does light have with darkness? God, God hates sin. He can't have fellowship with sin. And so to say it's okay to live in sin and be a part of the church, the Lord hates that. And he says, hey, you guys, you, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. That's good, because I also hate that. I heard somebody say, you know, uh, Christians ought to be known for what they're for, not for what they're against. Well, it's good to be known for what you're for. It's good to be known for what you're against. And the Lord points out, hey, I like the fact that you guys are against the Nicolaitans because I'm also against them. So they were standing against sin. That's a good thing. And they were practicing spiritual discernment. Look what he says in verse 2. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. Well, how did you find them to be false? You put them to the test. Not everybody who comes and says, well, I'm apostle so-and-so. They say, really? You're apostle so-and-so? Well, let us test you to make sure that you are genuine. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You know, we live in a day and age where people uh, are gullible, and they'll believe all kinds of things. And uh, it's like, hey, make sure that it's true. Make sure that it's coming from the book. Now, when Paul was in Berea, the scripture says, Acts 17, 11, but these in Berea were more no noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And so you have the Apostle Paul preaching. And so, uh, you know, we would say, if the Apostle Paul was preaching, you'd say, you don't need to check him out because that's the Apostle Paul and God's used him to write so much of the New Testament. But they said, well, we'll listen to Paul, but we're going to check to make sure Paul is telling the truth. That's a good thing. I tell people in our church, hey, check me out. And uh, we hand out sermon notes every Sunday, and, and I have scripture verses in there. And I said, check it out to make sure what I'm telling you is true. And if you don't think it is true, then ask me about it, because I don't want to teach error. Now, this church was doing a good thing because they were practicing spiritual discernment, and they were enduring hardship for his name. That's what he says Verse 3, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Remember this about Ephesus. Ephesus was a pagan city. It's a pagan Roman city, and in Ephesus, they worshipped Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh, that's what the Greeks called this goddess, Artemis. The Romans called the goddess Diana. But you had these, these silversmiths that made these little shrines to the Greek goddess Artemis. And they had this beautiful temple for this goddess Artemis. And if you read in Acts chapter 19, they got mad at Paul because he was turning people away from the false goddess Artemis and turning them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this one guy, Demetrius, who was a silversmith who made these little shrines and would sell them, said, hey, this guy Paul is messing us up. He's messing our business up because people aren't buying our stuff because he says Artemis is not a god at all. And remember, they got everybody to go into the theater, into that amphitheater, and for two hours, they began to shout, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Can you imagine? 
Shouting that for two hours? It's like going to an LSU football game. I mean, it's just, just long and just loud, and it's like, really? Do you have another cheer? That's all you got? Paul wanted to go in and talk to those people, and his friends wouldn't let him. They said, Paul, they're going to rip you uh, limb from limb if you do that. <coughs> this is a pagan place. This is a difficult place. And you know who pastored? Paul, he founded the church in Ephesus on a second missionary journey. Paul lived in Ephesus for about two and a half years, from about 52 to 53 uh, AD to about 55 or 56, right around in there. And Paul was pastor, and then he turned it over to Timothy. Timothy was pastor at the church in Ephesus. Uh, Apollos was there in Ephesus. You know, Apollos was the guy who, the Bible says of Apollos, he's mighty in the scriptures. John was there for 30 years in Ephesus. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, she lived in Ephesus. She died there in Ephesus. Ephesus was a a place that had a lot of big-name people in it, big-name Christian people. And it was a great church. They were doing a lot of great things. And it's in a difficult place. But here's the thing. The church in Ephesus was doing great things. But they were missing the greatest thing. Verse 4. But I have this against you. What do you have against us, Lord? That you have left your first love. That you've left your first love. You've departed from your first love. Now, the Lord is speaking to a solid church, a committed church, a church doing good things, but they were missing the greatest thing. And what's the greatest thing? Jesus was asked one day, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? You know, because the religious leaders would go back and forth talking about what's the greatest commandment. And they would argue back and forth. And some would say, well, the greatest commandment is going to be one of the Ten Commandments. I mean, it's got to be in the Ten Commandments because if you didn't make the Big Ten, how could you be the greatest commandment? So they would argue about which is the greatest commandment. And when they asked Jesus, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? He didn't go to Exodus 20 that gives us the, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. He went to Deuteronomy 6. And he says, here's the greatest commandment, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is the great and foremost commandment. And they were missing the greatest commandment because they had left their first love. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Now, how do we... How do we depart from God? How do we leave our first love? That word, when he says in verse 4, you have left your first love, that word means to uh, depart, to neglect, to forsake, to disregard. And it's done little by little by little. There's a song out that says it's a slow fade when you give yourself away. Men don't fall in a day. They just slowly fade away from the Lord. They slowly depart from the Lord. The greatest commandment is to love Him with everything that you have. All your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. And we could say that if that's the greatest commandment, then the greatest sin is to not love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. If you fail to do the greatest commandment, you're committing the greatest sin. You know, oftentimes we think, well, the greatest sin, I mean, that's got to be uh, some kind of murder, mass murder. Uh, if you're Jeffrey Dahmer, he's the greatest sinner. Uh, some kind of terrible, horrible uh, sexual sin, but rape, that's the greatest sin. No, we could say that the greatest sin would be failing to do the greatest commandment, and that's loving the Lord. I think something that we forget about it in church Christianity is all about heart. It's all about a heart relationship with God. The Pharisees, it was all about rules. It was all about check the box. And did I tie this week? Yes, I did. Check. Did I uh, have a quiet time? Check. Did I do this? Yes, check. Did I come to Sunday school? Yes, check. All these check marks. And Jesus said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Because Christianity is all about a heart relationship. 
And these people in Ephesus had left their first love. And the Lord says, I have this against you. Now, how did they leave their first love? They allowed other things to take first place. They do, or they did what you and I so often do. We just kind of drift away from the Lord. We don't just say, oh, Lord, you know, I woke up, I loved you yesterday, but today I don't love you, and I'm just not going to serve you at all. That's not what we do. We say, Lord, I love you, and then we miss a quiet time, and then we just kind of drift, and uh, somebody has said, you know, you miss one quiet time, one time with the Lord, uh, he notices. You miss two times with the Lord, you notice. You miss three or more times with the Lord, other people notice. Because the sweet aroma, the knowledge of him is not on your life anymore. And so we just slowly drift away. And this is what happens. We allow other things to take first place in our hearts. You know, the very first commandment. I am the Lord your God who delivered you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods that would come alongside of me. No other gods that would compete for number one in your heart. Because you're to love me with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. And it's so easy for us to allow other gods, lesser gods, to get in there and take first place. It's easy to let sports. We're a sports-crazed society. It's easy to let sports Get first place. And your favorite uh, school's team. Football is so big. Football is king. And and so we get all jazzed during football season. And, and, uh, you know, if you're not careful, it's like, hey, wait a minute. That seems like that's almost become your God. You know everything about this football team. Whether it's LSU or Texas A&M or the University of Texas or, or whoever it might be. You know everything, New Orleans Saints, whoever. You know everything about them. You know all their players. You know all the, the, the sports writers, what they're saying about uh, this team. And you study that stuff and you spend very little time with the Lord. And somebody could well say, it seems you love football a lot more than you love Jesus. Oh, we'd say, oh, no, 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 that's not the case. Well, that's where you spend your time. See, it's easy for that stuff. And none of that stuff is bad as long as it is kept in check, as long as it has its place. You know, family is good, but family can become your God if you're not careful. You shall have no other gods before me, no other gods alongside of me. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 says this, And he, the Lord Jesus, is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. You ask yourself, in my heart, does the Lord have first place? Do I love him more than I love anything else? Erwin Lutzer wrote a little book on prayer, and one of the prayers in there, I just love it, I pray it often. It's this. It says, God, give me a passion for you that would far exceed my passion for anything else. Because I want to love you supremely. This church, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. They'd allow other things to take first place. And here's the thing. If you had talked to the pastor of the church of Ephesus, and you said, hey, pastor, do you love Jesus? He would have said, yes, I love Jesus. Do the people in your church love Jesus? Yes, we love Jesus. Of course we love Jesus. The issue is not for this church, for you, for me. The issue is not, do you still love Jesus? The issue is this, do you still love Jesus as much as if not more, than you ever did. See, leaving your first love means I used to love him more than I love him now. That's the issue. Do you love him as much or more 
now than you used to. Because if you used to love him more and now you don't love him as much as you used to, you have left your first love. Now, when you think of first love, you know, so much of the time the Bible equates our relationship with God to our relationship in marriage. And why does it do that? Because it's, it's with another person and it's a dynamic thing. You know, your relationship in your marriage, for those of you who are married, you know that, uh, man, it can go good one day and bad the next day. Sometimes it can be good in the morning and bad in the afternoon. It's just like uh, something we got off here. Uh, we were doing really, really well, and then we got off. Your relationship with the Lord is dynamic. It's not just static. And you have to press into the Lord and grow in the Lord. And there are things that happen in our lives that we don't understand. We don't understand what the Lord is doing. You read in the book of Psalms. I love the book of Psalms because in Psalms, it's just, it's just true to life. It's just raw. It's just David writes so many of the Psalms, and he's just sharing his heart. And he'll say, uh, God, I love you so much. And then the next Psalm is like, God, where are you? I need you. Why are you hiding from me? You know, sometimes in our relationship with the Lord, it seems like God... God is hiding. He's not, but it can feel that way to us. And so the Bible compares that to a, a husband and wife relationship. Well, here's the thing. This scripture is talking about that first love, that, that honeymoon love, that I'm just so in love with you, I just want to be with you all the time. God wants us to have that kind of love that's not just built on emotion, although emotion needs to be in there. I mean, do you like to have a relationship with your spouse if you're married that is emotionless? I love you because I'm commanded to. I mean, that's not very good. My wife, Debbie, doesn't want to hear that. Now, sometimes, Debbie and I, I mean, we love each other, and even when we don't feel it, we love each other. And that doesn't change, but it's so nice when the emotions are there, when the feelings are there. And I'll tell Debbie, we have the little thing that we'll say, you know, I'm feeling a big surge of love for you right now. And she loves to hear that. Debbie, I'm having a big surge. And she'll, she'll say, well, tell me about it. You know, let's talk about that. Let's, let's capture this moment. But when I don't have a big surge or when she doesn't have a big surge for me, when the emotions are just not all there, it doesn't mean we don't love each other. But isn't it nice when the emotions are there? See, God likes it when, as we sang tonight, when we lift our hands and we thank him for the blood and we worship him. He likes that. He, he loves that. Hey, have you left your first love? Do you love the Lord as much as you used to? And if the answer is no, then you're just like the church in Ephesus, the people in Ephesus. I have this against you, the Lord says. You have drifted away from your first love. So they were doing some good things. They were missing the greatest thing. And the Lord gave them a prescription of four things. This is what he said to do. I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Prescription of four things. They all start with the letter R. First thing, remember. Remember. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Remember what it used to be like, how you were so in love with me, and what caused you to drift away. Remember that. You know, sometimes for somebody, it's like, hey, I was doing really, really well, and then I met this guy. And I started dating this guy, and I wasn't coming to church like I used to, and I wasn't reading my Bible, and he didn't seem to be too interested in that. And so that pulled me away from the Lord. Maybe it was a job. Man, I was doing so great, and then I got a new job. And the new job moved me away, and I was so active in my church. And then I had to go to a new town, and it was hard to find a new church. And I drifted away. See, all of us... Man, we, we need the fellowship of the church. We need to be around one another. Why? Because we're strengthened with one another. We spur one another on to love and good deeds. That's why the Bible says, not forsaking our own assembling as is the habit of some. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. 
For a lot of people, you know where they've fallen? You know what has caused them to fall away from the Lord? COVID. COVID. Because what did COVID do? Well, COVID got me so afraid that I didn't come to church. I was hiding under my bed. I was so afraid big bad COVID was going to come. I had uh, triple vax and quadruple masks and hiding out from COVID. Listen, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and discipline. And I know I'm not talking to anybody who's afraid of COVID here because you wouldn't be here. So th these are the folks that we're saying we're not afraid. But hey, listen, for a lot of people, what caused them to fall away was the fear of COVID. And they got out of going to church. And any of us, if we get out of the fellowship of the church, what happens? We start to cool in our love for God. We need one another and we need to be with other believers. And uh, hey, I'm all for... Uh, church on television. We've been on television. First Baptist Texarkana has been on television in Sh the Shreveport area for 55 plus years. And uh, you say, I don't think you don't look that old. Well, I hadn't been on that long. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I've, I've been at First Baptist Texarkana for 19 years. And so the church had been on for decades before I ever got there. And that's a great ministry to people that can't get out. But it's not a good substitute for people that can gather with the people of God. Television church, online church, doesn't minister in the same way as rubbing shoulders with another believer. Of being in the house, praising the Lord with other believers. And so maybe that's the place where you have fallen. You've gotten out of the fellowship of the church. It is important. Remember where you have fallen. And then he says, second R, repent. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent. Repent means to turn around. The, the Greek word is metanoia, change your mind. Change your mind of what you've been thinking. Turn, you're going in the wrong direction. You need to turn around and change your mind of what you've been thinking about God and about sin and about self. Repent, you're going in the wrong direction. You've been drifting away from me and you've been lying to yourself and you're saying, I'm doing okay, and you're not. You're going in the wrong direction. You need to turn around and get right with me. Acts 3.19, Peter, when he preached, he told the people, repent therefore and return that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So we repent we, we remember, we repent, and then he says, and do the deeds you did at first. Return to the deeds you did at first. What did you do uh, at first? What did you do in your relationship with the Lord when you began and you were so on fire for him and you were so excited about him and you wanted to tell everybody about Jesus because he had saved you. And th that was just the consuming passion of your life. When I was in college, I was growing so much in the Lord. I became a Christian when I was uh, 17 years old, a high school senior. And uh, my life began to change. And then I went off to college. I went to the University of Texas. And, you know, a lot of people go to the University of Texas and they go down the tubes because of all the partying and things like that. Well, I got in with some good guys and uh, I really started growing. I grew like a weed in college spiritually. And... Uh, I learned early on, hey, you share your faith and tell people about Jesus. And so uh, I was just conditioned. Anytime I would meet somebody, my very first thought was, does that person know Christ? I got I to gotta try and work the conversation around that I can talk to them about their soul. And that was just on my mind and on my heart. And I still remember <laughs> as a high school or a college freshman, my roommate in college, he had uh, pledged a fraternity and he was doing all this crazy stuff. And uh, we'd wake up on Saturday morning and I'd get up and my hands would just go up and just praise the Lord because I was so excited about the Lord and he was drunk and hung over and he was just like moaning. And I was thinking, you know, I'm so glad what God is doing in my life and, and I wish he would, <clears throat> you know, that Todd would, would turn around. Todd has turned around since that time. But there was just such a joy there. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and return. Do the deeds you did at first. 
What did you used to do when you were so excited about the Lord? You woke up and you talked to him. You woke up and you prayed. You woke up and you read, read your Bible. You woke up to say, hey, the very first thing I'm doing, I'm going to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to me. Go, go back to that. Go back to your prayer list. Make a prayer list and be diligent and consistent, not legalistically, but from the heart. Say, Lord, I'm going to do the things that I did at first. Think about your marriage. What was it like in the honeymoon? Well, the honeymoon was so exciting. I was just so excited to be with Debbie. She was so excited to be with me. And on the honeymoon, Debbie would say, hey, Jeff, can you get me a cup of coffee? Well, sure, I can get you a cup of coffee. We're on our honeymoon. We've been married 35 years. Jeff, can you get me a cup of coffee? Well, can't you get it yourself? You know? I mean, it's like, wait a minute. I don't need to do that. I need to do the things I did at first. Because that's how I won her heart, by ministering to her and by serving her and by loving her. And the Lord says, hey, do the things you used to do. And seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. And then he says, the fourth R, respond Quickly, respond quickly. Look at it. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else. Or else what, Lord? Or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. I will shut your church down if your church isn't all about me. That's what he's saying. Psalm 115, verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. It's all about Jesus. And he says, hey, unless you get right with me, I'm not going to keep blessing you if you're wandering away. You need to get back to what, is, to what this is all about, loving me with all your heart. And then you can love your neighbor as yourself and you can make an impact and I can use you in a great way. But if you don't, then I will come and shut you down. If there's no love in your church for me, then there'll be no light and I'll take the lampstand out and your church will be no more. Did you know that Lifeway Research, Tom Rainer said between 6,000 and 10,000 churches close every year in America. Between 100 and 200 churches close each week. Why is that? Well, I guess we could say one reason. Maybe the Lord shut them down. Maybe there's no love. And so there's no love, there's no light, there's no life. Because God says what's important is you loving me and worshiping me in spirit and in truth. The time to respond to the Lord is now. Now. Do you know that's God's favorite word, now? Isaiah 118. He says, come now. And let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come now. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next, next month. Come now. You know what the devil's favorite word is? Later. Tomorrow. Let's do it later. So we're getting ready to have a, a time of invitation for you to come, for you to pray, for you to make decisions for the Lord. And the Lord says, come now. And the devil says, not now. Not now. Later. You're busy now. You, you got other things to do now. So Come later, because later will be better. There was a restaurant when I was in Houston called Joe's Crab Shack. I don't know if they have Joe's Crab Shack here. But they had a sign out in front of Joe's Crab Shack, and it said, free crabs tomorrow. <laughs> I always missed it, because it was like, dang, I came today, and it's, it's tomorrow. <laughs> free crabs tomorrow. That's what the devil says. Hey, just do it tomorrow. Do it later. God says, tomorrow may never come. Come now. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Are you wandering away from the Lord? 
You know what's interesting? Robert Robinson wrote that song, Prone to Wander, Lord, I Feel It, Prone to Leave the God I Love. And he knew. But as he got older in his life, he really wandered away from the Lord. And he got all fouled up and tangled up in sin. And the story is told, we, it's hard to verify this exactly, but the story is told about him when he was an older man. He was riding in a carriage and sitting across from him was an older lady and she was humming the tune, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And she said to Robert Robinson, not knowing who he was, she said, Sir, are you familiar with that tune? And he said, Yes, I am. And she said, Sir, what do you think about that tune? And he said to her, Ma'am, he said, I'm the poor, unhappy man who wrote the words to that song many years ago. And I would give a thousand worlds, if I had them, to enjoy the feelings now that I had then. She said to him, the song says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. You don't have to give a thousand worlds in order to have the peace and joy that you once had. All you have to do is remember from where you have fallen. Repent and return and respond quickly. If you'll take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Listen, no doubt there are lots of us in this room and we need to come back to the Lord. And we need to be honest enough to say, God, I need, a, I need a fresh touch from you. God, I can tell my heart is just not on fire like it used to be for you. I need you to do a work in me. That's what revival is when he does a work in his children. And that spills out. And see, there are people at your office, people at your school, people who watch you, people who look at you, and they know you're a Christian, and they know that you're just kind of on the fence if they see you get right with God if they see you get excited about the Lord if they see you get passionate about him they say there's something going on at Eastwood Baptist Church God is at work at the, in this place I need to come check it out and when Christians get revived that's when people get saved we need revival to hit America it can start in here tonight father in heaven we thank you for your word that is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And Lord, we identify with the words of that song, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Lord, we do love you, but we want to be so in love with you. We want to have that first love. We want to be white hot with passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, show us. Help us to remember how it used to be. Lord, bring us back to the place where we love the cross, where we can't help but tell people about you where we can't wait to open up your book, where we can't wait to come to church and worship you. Lord, bring us back to that place. Repent, therefore, and return and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming quickly and will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Lord, we want you to have your way in our hearts and in our lives. God, I pray for those who've never put their faith and trust in Jesus that tonight would be the night that they would receive Christ as Savior and Lord. I pray, God, for those who are believers, but they, they've wandered, they've drifted. They're still involved in church, but they know that their hearts aren't on fire for you like they used to be. Lord, set our souls on fire. Set our hearts on fire for Jesus once again. And Lord, I pray that we would have a great time of commitment 
a great time to come to the altar and pray and just receive a special touch, a time of refreshing from you. Lord, have your way in each heart. We pray in Jesus' name.